When sound waves from musical instruments and voices move through the air, naturally, they're subject to interaction with the physical environment around them. This interaction will affect the waves, changing the sound, sometimes for the better, sometimes not. Learning about the behavior of sound waves and their physical environments is, of course, the study of acoustics. During the recording of live sound, on stage or in the studio, we need to take into account the behavior and interaction of sound waves with the recording space to make sure we avoid any problems and take advantage of any benefits the environment brings. Later, in mixing, we may want to simulate the kind of beneficial interaction that sound has with a good environment by creating effects based on a knowledge of acoustics and psychoacoustic phenomena. Phasing, flanging, chorusing, doubling, echo, and reverb are all effects that are based on acoustic phenomena. And, since everything we do in recording and mixing is based on what we hear in our studio environment, even small project studios or home studios can benefit from the application of a little knowledge about room acoustics to the design of the recording and mixing spaces. In this course, the third installment in the Audio Concepts series, I'll cover the background theory of acoustics. And then in the following course, I'll go over those classic effects I just mentioned that make use of acoustic phenomena. I'll begin with a brief recap of the relevant concepts from the first course in this series, and then go on from there. So, to start out, imagine a sound wave in the air, coming from a musical instrument, on its way to a listener's ears, or a microphone. The air pressure variations, the compressions and rarefactions of the air molecules, move through the air. The intensity of the variations corresponds to the amplitude of the sound, which we perceive as loudness. The wave also has a particular frequency of vibration, measured in cycles per second, or hertz, which we perceive as pitch. Now, sound waves travel through the air at a fixed speed, 1130 feet per second. So in the time it takes a wave to complete one cycle of vibration, the wave, moving through the air at that fixed speed, will have traveled a certain distance. This distance will correspond to the frequency of the wave. It's the actual physical wavelength of a sound wave at that frequency. Now, in the earlier course, I'd mentioned wavelength as a concept, something you see on a graph or an oscilloscope trace of a sound wave. But now I'm talking about the actual distance, in feet or inches, that a wave of a particular frequency travels in the air, in a physical space. So, for example, the wave of a low-pitched note with a low frequency might travel several feet through the air in the time it takes to complete one cycle of vibration. A higher-pitched note with a higher frequency, a faster rate of vibration, might travel only a few inches in the time it takes to complete one cycle. For the most part, I've shied away from formulas in this series of courses, but if you're ever designing a room for audio or troubleshooting the sound of your studio space, you might actually find yourself measuring and mapping out the behavior of sound waves in the room. So I'll give you this one. It's a simple formula for calculating the wavelength at a particular frequency. It's the speed of sound, 1130 feet per second, divided by the frequency. So if you wanted to know the wavelength of the lowest note on a four-string bass, it's 1130 divided by 41 hertz which comes out to a wavelength of 27 feet 6 inches. If, for example, your room isn't that big, or if one dimension is exactly half that length, you could use this information to help determine what will happen to notes with that pitch in the room and how to deal with it if there turns out to be an issue with low-frequency sound in the space. The whole idea of the physical wavelength of sounds is an important concept is the interaction of sound waves in a room is governed very much by the wavelengths of the various frequencies present, including the frequencies of the harmonics and overtones contained in the typical complex sound waves that mostly make up music and voice. And this interaction gives rise to a whole host of effects, some good, some bad, but all important to understand thoroughly if you want to have a good handle on both the problems and creative techniques that those interactions bring to recording and mixing. In the next few tutorials, I'll go over the basic behavior of sound waves in an enclosed space, 
and eventually I'll move on to practical applications and troubleshooting the sound of a room.